For today's video, I'll be covering some of the more commonly overlooked causes of ammonia spikes in aquariums and how you can prevent them from becoming a problem. When I say ammonia spike, I'm talking about an unexpected rise in toxic ammonia levels after your tank has already completed its initial cycle. By this stage, the aquarium is usually stocked with fish, which means that any spike can lead to gill burns and other health issues. That's why understanding how to prevent them is so important as it can save both you and your fish a lot of trouble. As usual, I do have a fully sourced article linked in the description that accompanies this video. So first up is KH depletion. This happens when the carbonate hardness in your aquarium suddenly drops below around 4.5 dKH or around 80 ppm. At this point, the bacteria responsible for converting toxic ammonia into toxic nitrite have already started to die off, which can lead to an ammonia buildup. You can use a KH test kit if you like, but in reality, this is mainly a concern for aquariums that have hard water, which is higher in pH and often warmer or tropical temperature ranges. That's because the ammonia oxidizing bacteria that are used in this type of aquarium require KH to function correctly. On top of that, at higher pH levels, ammonia usually exists in its more toxic form of ammonia rather than the far less harmful form of ammonium, so it's especially important to stay on top of this in a high pH tank. The good news is that KH depletion is usually very easy to prevent in the average high pH tank as long as your tank isn't heavily stocked or heavily fed. Most people should find that regular partial water changes are enough to replenish the depleted KH level in their tank with the KH in their tap water. If needed, you can use a KH mineral salt or a limestone-based rock as hardscape such as Siriu stone, but this usually isn't going to be needed because your tap water will usually have a higher KH for this type of aquarium anyway. Now there is some overlap in the exact cutoffs where different types of bacteria will start to grow, but if your tank has a pH below 7.3 and usually stays under 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, this shouldn't be an issue for your specific aquarium. This is because in those low pH subtropical temperature tanks, we don't usually use the same type of bacteria. We'll run ammonia oxidizing RK and Comamox bacteria to hold the cycle in our tanks which don't require KH in the same way. But if you do have a higher pH tank which usually runs warmer water, this is definitely something to keep an eye on. Next up is low dissolved oxygen levels in your tank because just like your fish, the microorganisms that drive your nitrogen cycle also need oxygen to breathe and survive. In a heavily stocked tank, these microorganisms can actually become the main consumers of dissolved oxygen in your tank and overtake the actual fish. When oxygen levels do start to drop, you'll often notice that your fish will start gasping at the surface of your tank and if you keep any type of shrimp, they'll usually all go towards the top inch or two of the water column. This is usually a clear sign of low dissolved oxygen levels in the tank and the fish and shrimp are going to this area because that's where the gas exchange with the surface is most efficient so they can actually breathe. The real problem comes when your beneficial microorganisms begin to die off due to a lack of oxygen in the water because the fewer of them you have to process the nitrogen, the higher the ammonia levels can spike. Thankfully this one is also very easy to fix because in most cases simply adding an air stone with an air powered filter connected to it is enough to fix the issue. The rise in bubbles from the air stone increase the surface area contact between atmospheric air and the water and as they break the surface they also create ripples. These ripples also increase the surface area contact even further, but they also weaken the surface water's tension, making gas exchange even more efficient. Just be sure to scale up the number of air stones or air powered filters as well as the power of your pump for larger tank sizes to make sure everything is balanced. But on the other side of this, if your tank is lightly stocked and has plenty of healthy grown plants in there, low oxygen really isn't a major issue that you should have to worry about. So moving on and we get to sudden and significant temperature swings in your tank, especially those that last for several days at a time rather than just a couple of hours. This can happen during heat waves or cold snaps so it works both ways so keep that in mind. For example, I had a few hot spells in my fish room last month that pushed my water temperatures well above normal. 
This can cause two major problems and the first is that certain microorganisms that convert ammonia into nitrite struggle to function in higher or lower water temperatures than they are used to. The second one is that warmer water holds less oxygen, tying back into my previous section where low dissolved oxygen levels in the tank can become an issue. When combined, these two factors can quickly trigger high ammonia spikes in a tank. On paper, the cutoff point between what I'll call tropical microorganisms, which are ammonia and nitrite oxidizing bacteria, and what I'll call subtropical microorganisms, which are ammonia oxidizing archaea and comamox bacteria, is usually around 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of the year, my fish room runs comfortably within the subtropical temperature range due to modern house and insulation keeping things warm even during the winter. But during the British summer, my water temperatures do tend to creep up to around 25 degrees Celsius, which is the cutoff point for these two types of microorganisms. Now, there is some overlap between the two, and it's not like your microorganisms are suddenly going to die off as soon as there's a temperature spike, but if it does last for a couple of days, it may be worth testing your water on a regular basis and monitoring ammonia and nitrite levels. The same thing can happen for people in tropical areas too, where cold snaps can dip your temperature suddenly and cause the tropical microorganisms to have issues, and this one technically is more of an issue because the subtropical microorganisms usually have a longer doubling time, meaning they'll take longer to establish in your tanks. So another way to come at this is that it's kind of a reverse Goldilocks issue. Provided things are too hot or too cold, it's not much of an issue. It's when you get to that just right middle zone where this can become a problem in your tank. Next up are pH swings, which are similar to temperature swings. For the most part, short-term changes usually aren't going to be an issue, but sudden significant swings in pH that last for several days or even months can disrupt your tank and potentially trigger an ammonia spike. I'll be sticking with the terminology I used during the temperature section just to keep everything more consistent, so the more common tropical microorganisms in the hobby tend to thrive at a pH of about 7.3 up to 8.0. The subtropical microorganisms usually have a little bit of overlap with that at the higher end and then they'll work down to around 6.0 and then below that we have the nitro to go bacteria which can handle a pH from around 6.0 down to 5.7. Now this one isn't actually as bad as heat spells because high temperatures also reduce the dissolved oxygen in the water adding another layer to that problem. On top of that, when it comes to pH swings, a lot of the time the actual aquarium keeper has to accidentally do something without realising it that'll trigger the problem. A good example of this is adding aqua soil to an established aquarium that is used to having hard alkaline water. This is because aqua soil will release a lot of hydrogen ions into the water column which will buffer the pH and rapidly decrease it. If you don't have limestone based rocks or other buffering in place, your KH might not be enough to counteract this and your pH can drop by a drastic amount in a short period of time. Again, specifically in a hard water alkaline aquarium, this can easily take your pH from the tropical range where that type of microorganism is very happy, down into the subtropical range where the established colonies of the tropical microorganisms that are holding the cycle may start to die off. In this specific situation, the bio load of your fish hasn't changed, it's the pH levels in your tank, so the actual amount of waste being produced in the tank still needs to be processed. Unfortunately, the established microorganism colonies in your tank are used to a very specific pH range, so after the drop they may not function at full efficiency or they may even start to die. Either way, the ammonia levels in your tank can start to climb resulting in a problem. The easiest way to prevent this is to research any major changes you're going to do to an established tank and make sure they're not going to change the pH or KH levels or anything like that. Next up, I want to stick with aqua soil and talk about the initial ammonia release. This is because a lot of aqua soil products on the market are enriched with nitrogen sources to boost plant growth, but this also means that there'll usually be an initial ammonia spike when first added to the tank. To try and explain this one better, I do want to come at it with two different examples for two very different aquariums. 
First, I'm going to be using a tank like mine because my tap water has a low pH of around 6.4, a GH of around 4 and a KH of around 3. In this specific case, the aquasol shouldn't cause much of a difference in your pH range, but it will still increase the ammonia levels on your test kit. This really shouldn't be a problem for most people with a mature aquarium with these water parameters. That's because the established colonies of subtropical microorganisms which I mentioned earlier can quickly adapt to manage the change. Now I'm just going to make these numbers up to keep the calculations as simple as possible but imagine your aquasoil doubles the ammonia in your tank so your microorganism colonies need to double in size to handle it and keep everything safe. Again to keep the math simple, Imagine if your doubling time for your current microorganisms is one day, so within 24 hours, your current colony size can double in size to deal with the problem and keep it under control. On top of that, because we have a low pH range in the tank, the excess hydrogen ions are going to bond to the toxic ammonia and convert that into the far less toxic ammonium. This heavily swings the toxic ammonia to ammonium ratio in our favour and most of the time this really won't be an issue for your fish because things will rapidly adjust and your tank will balance quickly. So with this specific situation where we run a soft water tank there's not really much we have to do it's just going to fix itself. But for the second scenario and this time we're going to go to a high pH tank with this specific set of water parameters, we'll usually have a more mature, stronger range of tropical microorganisms that prefer that higher pH range. So when you add your aquasoil to this type of tank, it starts buffering the pH in a downward direction and it'll eventually cross that microbial crossover point for your pH and it can either wipe out or severely weaken your tropical bacteria colonies. So suddenly you now have a low pH tank, but there's minimal beneficial microorganisms left to handle the waste that's being produced by your fish or the increased ammonia that's being leaked into the water column. So you need your ammonia oxidizing RK colonies to start growing in the tank, but this can take longer because they have a longer doubling time than the tropical microorganisms. Then these guys start converting the toxic ammonia and far less toxic ammonium into toxic nitrite. Now the problem is, toxic nitrite doesn't have a less toxic form like ammonia so it's usually going to be a problem with this type of tank where we've just crashed the microorganism colony. So because of that, the actual initial start time of the Comamox bacteria which will deal with the nitrite buildup is going to be delayed because of the slow growth of the ammonia oxidizing RK which will convert the ammonia into the nitrite. Now to be clear, because we've drastically reduced the pH of the water, it's still highly likely that there's going to be a minimal amount of toxic ammonia in the tank and it'll largely be the far less toxic ammonium. So the problem here is the nitrite buildup, not technically the ammonia spike, because the nitrite can cause problems with the blood of our fish's ability to carry oxygen around its body. So in this specific situation it may result in you having to do a lot of daily water changes and I'm not just talking about small amounts either, I'm talking about large daily water changes potentially for weeks until your subtropical colonies grow enough to keep up with the demand. And don't waste money on beneficial bacteria in a bottle in this situation, think it's going to make things cycle quickly because to my knowledge they only contain the tropical strains of bacteria which require the higher pH that we've just wiped out. Now there is a way we can limit the risk with this and that's basically making sure we have a lot of carbonate hardness in the tank to lock up a lot of those hydrogen ions from the aquasoil in the carbonate buffering system. But when adding aquasoil to a high pH aquarium there's always going to be some level of risk of this causing an issue. Moving on and we get to filter disruption which is basically doing something to the biological media in your tank which harms the beneficial microorganisms. The most common example of this is when people use a cartridge system in their internal or hang on back filter. In my opinion these cartridges are usually designed to make the manufacturer as much money as possible when ke people keep buying them rather than keep your fish safe. Every time the filter floss component on these cartridges clog you have to replace the full cartridge to keep the filter working correctly and a lot of them are all in one so you have to throw away your biological media with it. 
Personally, I hate these cartridges and I just use them as a template to customise my filters with 30 ppi foam for better performance and you don't have to throw it away every couple of weeks. So that is one way to prevent this from becoming an issue and causing ammonia spikes in your tank. The second common mistake is cleaning your biological filter media too aggressively. Now remember earlier in the video when I mentioned some temperature ranges for these microorganisms and none of them went even close to boiling water, so please never clean your biological filter media in boiling water, it's basically going to kill your biomedia colony and crash your cycle. On top of that we also have the risk of chlorine and chloramine in the tap water causing problems and I know technically you can use it with minimal risk but it is still a risk. This is why I prefer to clean my biomedia in my filtered tanks on the days I do a water change because we've already got that aged water which is the right temperature, there shouldn't be any chlorine or chloramines in it, so when you do your water change, get your biomedia out and give it a quick rinse, and I literally mean 15 seconds max, that's all I do, and then it goes back in the filter. So far I haven't noticed any problems with ammonia or nitrite levels in my tank when cleaning the biomedia in this way so that's what I'm going to keep doing in the future. Anyway guys that brings the video to an end, I hope it's been helpful, thanks for watching and good luck avoiding any ammonia spikes in your tanks.